guys how are you good hmm? So good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Gateway Regional Chamber of Commerce debate for the 7th Congressional District. My name is Jim Coyle. I am the president of the Gateway Regional Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome all of you here today. We have a very full room with a lot of press. And this has been actually kind of a, a large affair to bring together this year. And so there are a lot of people that that really need to be thanked. But I especially want to recognize the campaigns of both Mr. Malinowski and Mr. Kane. They worked very closely with us to put this together. Uh, my staff has worked tirelessly and continue to do so. You'll see them running all over the place. Um, Kaz Bielan, our videographer from Premier Media, um, is working. We have a live feed going of this event and we expect a lot of people to be watching it. Um, Robert Batiste from Extreme Excellent Entertainment is doing the sound. So if you can't hear, um, raise your hand and, and Robert will make sure that we get that right. But then finally, I really wanna thank the Holiday Inn and the, the staff here 
for those of you who don't follow these kind of trends, um, finding enough workers in the hospitality industry is a real challenge. And so the Holiday Inn really went through a lot of efforts to, to get us here. And then finally, I wanna recognize our sponsors this morning. Um, they are Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, Spencer Savings Bank, AJ Jersey, which is New Jersey's premier warehouse automation company, Community Access Unlimited, and Inroads to Opportunity. So if you could all join me in giving them a big hand. <laughs> so we have been hosting this debate for 24 years now. Um, we have never had a room this full, and we've never had this much press coverage. So I kind of wonder why. What what makes this year so different? Um, it's you, Jim. <laughs> thank you. But uh, Gateway is the largest business association in the North Jersey, New York metropolitan region, and we unequivocally support a strong economy and a vibrant business community. And as such, um, these debates are comprised of questions concerning only business and economic issues. Um, our plan is to have a serious discussion on these issues. Um, we hope that you will find it incredibly boring, but informative. Um, we need the detail, uh, we need much more detail than, usual, than the usual one or two line responses that you see in a campaign. Now, let me say that I know both of these men well, and I have worked closely with them for years. I consider them both to be friends. Um, I respect them both. They are both serious and they are both thoughtful and smart. Um, they are both strong supporters of the business community and they are both gentlemen and patriots. And I expect that they will comport themselves as such this morning. So quick note on titles. Um, both candidates have prestigious titles. We have congressman and we have senator. Um, but in, the, in this debate, both of them are applying for the job as representative for the 7th Congressional District. So I will refer to both of them as Mr. Um, rather than using their elected titles. So finally, um, let me say a little bit about um, the, the debate format because I do not like this format. Every two years when we put this together, um, we survey our membership about topics that are of importance to them. We call that down to five topics, and then we are allowed to do two questions on each topic. And the responses, the time that I can allow for that is three minutes. And really, how do you have a serious discussion when you only have three minutes to answer? But if I gave unlimited time, we would be here all day, um, and that probably wouldn't work either. So um, ground rules. Each candidate will give a three-minute opening statement and finish with a three-minute closing statement. The order was chosen by a coin flip with campaign managers from both campaigns. Questions will be asked on five topics. The topics were provided to the candidates in advance but not the specific questions that will be asked. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer a question. Each candidate will then have two minutes to do a rebuttal um, of what their opponent said or two minutes to answer a, another question. Um, we have a timekeeper um, hold up the cards so the candidates can see them. Um, after, with 30 seconds left, the yellow card will go up and when your time is up, the red card will go up. So please keep an eye on, on that timekeeper. If you don't, I will be, and I will cut you off. Um, finally, I'm gonna ask the audience to refrain from getting overly excited and clapping, yelling, or especially making rude noises um, during the answers. After all, what we're talking about is economics here, and you know how exciting could that be? Um, so we're going to begin with three minutes um, opening statements. Um, as I said, the two campaigns have flipped a coin. And Mr. Kane, um, please, you are first. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you to the chamber. Thank you for the people who are here in this room. 
paying so much attention um, to our, um, our democracy and being involved in the process. I believe deeply in public service. And I've seen my entire life where one person can make a difference in another person's life, whether as a volunteer firefighter or in the state Senate as Senate Republican leader. I blocked billions of dollars in spending and taxes that otherwise would have been foisted on the hardworking citizens of New Jersey. I preserved the character of our communities and I created new jobs and new economies so generations of businesses could stay in the state of New Jersey. Now, whether it was brew pubs, Bell Labs, or anybody else had a dream for the state of New Jersey, I listened so I could work on their behalf. But now, the issues that are impacting the residents of this district, well, they're national in scope. We have the highest rate of inflation outrageous spending in Washington, D.C. In, that we've had in 40 years. And when we look at what the problem is, it's because the incumbent member of Congress, Tom Molinowski, votes with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. Economists warned, whether they were Republican or Democrat, that this amount of spending would cripple the economy, would hurt the supply chains, make New Jersey and this country far more unaffordable and less secure at home and abroad. But instead of listening to the economist, instead of listening to his constituents, he followed Nancy Pelosi's lead 100% of the time. And as a result, we've got this out of control inflation. I'm running for Congress so I can break the back of inflation responsibly cut the spending coming out of Washington, D.C., ensure that we're energy independent once again. We've got to secure the southern border, make our streets safer. We've got to lower taxes and lessen regulations in a responsible way. I am asking for your vote and your support today because I've been in the majority. I've been in the minority. I've been in a split chamber. I've had Republican and Democratic governors alike. I've always found a way to be part of the governing coalition because that's what my constituents have always needed. I am asking for your support here today and going into November so I can make that difference and be a leader on your behalf down in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Okay, come on, let's, let's try to hold the clapping. Uh, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, here today. Let's get right down to it. Um, when I first ran for Congress, now more than four years ago, people I was speaking to in this district, Republicans and Democrats, had basically lost faith that government could do anything for them with all the partisanship and gridlock and corruption in Washington. I promised to try. I promised to put country over party, people over politics and to actually try to do something for New Jersey in this country. Here's what happened. People asked me to save the Affordable Care Act, protect our health care, make it more affordable, and we did. They asked me to finally do something about skyrocketing drug prices in America, to finally allow Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices with the pharmaceutical companies, and we did. They asked me to pass an infrastructure bill, President Trump had run on that, hadn't done it. And we did, the biggest investment in American infrastructure in this country's history, more than enough to pay for the gateway tunnel, to protect our communities from flooding, to fix the roads and bridges in the state of New Jersey. We did that. They asked me to stop the bleeding of jobs overseas, to end the era of outsourcing in America. And we passed the Chips and Science Act this summer to bring back advanced manufacturing to the United States. They asked me to do something about the scourge of gun violence in this country to protect our kids. And finally, we passed the first gun violence prevention bill in three decades. We beat the NRA, and we're going to do it again. They asked me to do something about the climate crisis, about the extreme weather that is hurting the state of New Jersey. We all lived through Hurricane Ida. And to do something to make America the leader in the transition to clean energy 
in the world, and we did this summer in the biggest possible way, passing a bill that will finally help make this country free from dependence on foreign oil and foreign dictators. And now we find ourselves facing a whole new set of grave challenges. This is a very difficult situation, probably the most dangerous world situation that we've had in my lifetime. We're facing a horrible problem of inflation in the United States and every country in the world. It's hurting every single one of us. And as you listen to us today, I hope you ask yourselves a couple of questions. Who has actually delivered? Compare my record in four years in Washington to Tom Kane's record in 20 years in Trenton. And who has a plan? Senator Kane hasn't said very much about what he would actually do to break the back of inflation. Maybe he will today. I'm going to be very curious to hear what it is. His party in Washington, the ascendant leaders of his party in Washington, have put forward absolutely no plan to deal with this economic situation. But they do have a very specific plan for banning abortion. That's the difference. It's moderation versus MAGA. It's bridge builders versus bomb throwers. Okay, it's we're at the infrastructure end of bills or insurrection. We make the choice. Thank you. Okay, again, if we could hold the applause, please. So not surprisingly, the first topic that we're going to discuss today is, is inflation. Mr. Malinowski, um, you supported, I'm pretty sure, every piece of COVID relief legislation, starting with the CARES Act in March 2020. In fact, I remember speaking to you um, about this when the economy was in free fall, and it was widely agreed that we needed to throw a lot of money at the problem. Um, by December 2020, however, the economy had stabilized and was humming along. However, Congress passed the COVID Relief Act at $900 billion, and President Trump signed it as his last major piece of legislation. And then that was followed by the American Rescue Plan at $1.9 trillion in March of 2021. The San Francisco Fed, the most progressive of all the Federal Reserve banks, estimates that these two pieces of legislation are responsible for 3% of the current 8% inflation rate. Did we end up throwing too much money at COVID? So um, let's remember where we were uh, two years ago today. The American economy was in free fall, as you correctly put it, Jim. Um, tens of millions of Americans were unemployed through no fault of their own. Virtually every single business, particularly the main street businesses in America, was shut down. And you know, Mr. Kane referred to economists, every single economist in America was telling us, do something big, do something fast to solve that problem. And had we not done so, this country would today be in a Great Depression. Those jobs would not have come back. Those businesses would not have come back. Um, I'd love to hear Senator Kane tell us exactly what we did that he thought was wrong. I make no apology from bringing the American economy back from what would have been a Great depression. Now, um, what else might we have done wrong? I don't know. Again, he hasn't been specific. Um, in the, the final bill that we passed, uh, we provided something that I fought for very, very hard, and that was direct assistance to our small municipalities and to our counties. Um, do you know who I was listening to when I did that? Our mayors, our county officials, Republicans and Democrats, I convened meeting after meeting after meeting to hear their needs. They were bleeding revenue because of the COVID pandemic. And many of them wrote to Washington. They wrote, Republicans and Democrats from our district wrote to Washington asking for us to do this. I gather Senator Kane would have been against that. He would have been against listening to our elected Republican and Democratic officials in this district to do what was right. We did what was right. They were able to pay the firefighters and the cops, uh, keep our public services going. The Warren County uh, commissioners, all Republican obviously, put out a statement earlier this year saying that they've been able to cut property taxes in Warren County because of the American Rescue Plan. So we did the right thing. We brought back the jobs, we brought back the businesses, 
Now we face the challenge of bringing back the paychecks that go with those jobs because inflation is a very, very serious problem. But I'd much rather be facing that challenge than having an American economy in a Great Depression. Thank you. Mr. Kane. Inflation is running over 8%, a level mm -hmm. not seen since the 1970s. Why are we in this inflationary cycle and how can we fix it and get back to a lower um, rate? I have a friend who lives in Rahway. He's a carpenter. He tells me that his monthly living expenses are up over $800 a month. Think about that. That's unacceptable in that household or any household across this state. And it's directly because Don Molinowski didn't listen to the economists who said, you can't continue this spending. Even the New York Times, in retrospect, said maybe they spent too much. Maybe they continued to exacerbate the problem and make it worse. Because he only listened to Nancy Pelosi, every single place that he want, she wanted her, him to vote and to be, he was there. That's not the type of responsible leadership we need on your behalf down in Washington, D.C. In the legislature, I led the way to block billions in spending, to find responsible cuts. I would never would have allowed things like luxury golf courses to get funded, ski slopes, um, hotels with f federal government money, money in the way he did. The extra IRS agents, 85,000 of them. Think about that. It's a, what, MetLife Stadium full of permanent IRS agents continually in, in government. So the things that you need to do, as I have done in Trenton, fight for responsibly reducing spending and you know, control costs, lower taxes so we can okay, have sorry, more we're entrepreneurial. Out of, we're out of time on this. Yes, lessen the regulations. Make sure we're energy independent. And finally, shorten the supply chains. So there's more manufacturing here and less um, transportation costs because all of that aggregate energy expense hurts us as, you know, thank everybody you, who's living you, in our Kane. homes. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski, gas prices are a major component of inflation and probably the most complained about. I do it every time I fill up my car. Should we take the brakes off oil production um, and use that to get prices down in this country? Um, so I think we're going to be playing the Nancy Pelosi drinking game. Whoever uh, had Nancy Pelosi is going to be really hammered by the end of this. Uh, <laughs> so um, let, let me, there's a bunch there I'd like to rebut at some point, but you asked about gas, gas prices. Price. Um, absolutely. And um, one of the look, one of the things we actually did in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is uh, lied about all the time, is we, we put a rule in there that said for every new uh, lease that the government gives out for solar or wind projects, for renewable energy projects, there has to be one new lease for a fossil fuel project in the United States. We understand that we need increased energy production in the United States right now of all varieties. We also need increased energy production across the world. I am the leading voice in the United States Congress right now for holding Saudi Arabia accountable for what they just did to hurt the United States and help Russia by cutting oil production. I understand that. But at the same time, if we want to be free of dependence on foreign energy and oil, foreign oil, we have to understand that oil is a global commodity. Even if we increase oil production and refining in the United States, and by the way, refining is the big problem right now. We are producing as much oil in America today as we were three years ago. The problem is the refineries, the, the oil companies were, uh, were, were not investing in uh, maintenance of, of, of refineries. They shut down refineries. Even if we did that, we would still be at the mercy of the Saudis and the Russians and the Venezuelans, and we will be until we move to clean energy. So the bill we passed supports oil and gas development in the United States right now, but represents the biggest investment we've ever made in making America the leader of the world in transitioning to clean energy. That is the way we break the back of our dependence on 
these on foreign oil and dictators. Thank you. Mr. Cain, same question. Should we take the brakes off oil and gas production in this country? My opponent is the leading voice for the failed policies that have gotten us to the situation we are right today, where we're dependent on other individuals to have different priorities than we do here at home. The fact that my opponent uh, has, you know, then this uh, allies down Washington, D.C. have made it harder to drill here at home, not to complete things like the Keystone Pipeline. We need an all of the above energy strategy, includes nuclear, includes offshore wind. I've supported uh, both of those. But if we're truly going to be energy independent, we've got to make sure that we've got the cleanest oil and natural gas that's being drilled here in our, this country versus any other country. We should be energy you know, efficient and energy independent. But the policies, it's not just the actual bills that pass. It's also making sure that the oversight over the administration, which is not allowing those leases to go through, not allowing us to do these things going, uh, going forward in a timely fashion, we need to ensure that we uh, rely on American energy. And my opponent and his um, president have, have not allowed us to rely on energy, our own energy resources in a responsible way. And because the reason that we are at risk whether it's with Saudi Arabia, whether it's Iran, Russia, Venezuela, or anybody else, is because he's not trusting the American energy industry and you know, for us to you know, rely on our own uh, energy for our own common futures. Instead, it's relying uh, for others to make decisions on behalf of Americans. That's not leadership, and that's the wrong direction. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our second topic, which is the workforce. Mr. Kane. Mm -hmm. We are seeing rapid increases in wages, which factor into the inflation rate. In large part, this is because there are millions of jobs that are going unfilled. Mm -hmm. I often say that if I had 10,000 high school students with no skills and no experience, I could get them jobs tomorrow, paying between thirty-four dollars and $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Have our benef benefit programs gone too far? How do we get people back to work? Um, I think there uh, is no question that the nature of the American workforce right now is changing. And I think when you, um, whether it's trying to get a car repaired or whether you're looking for your uh, favorite uh, grocery, uh, you, know, you know, cereal at your local grocery store, um, we've all seen delays, and that means the supply chains are interrupted. It means the warehouses aren't being emptied. It means the ships aren't being unloaded. Uh, and it, so it's a, it's a many-faceted thing. It includes um, many uh, component parts. Uh, so the first thing we need to ensure is we continue to have broadband infrastructure for those different work hours so individuals can uh, work at home uh, and infrastructure like the Gateway Project to ensure We've got a robust transportation and infrastructure. We've got to make sure we got skills training programs to um, make sure those individuals are educated and able to do the job. And we also need to uh, ensure that we uh, lower the overall tax burden on individuals so that we can uh, have that type of, of, of partnership to um, make sure people are able to get to work and, and have, a, have an education um, to achieve um, that, that their better tomorrows. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski, same question. Are our benefit programs encouraging people not to work? And how can we get people back to work? Uh, sure. So let me, let me just go back to the last all important exchange. Um, Senator Kane said he would end inflation. Didn't say a word about how he would do it apart from fixing supply chains and energy independence. The two huge bills that we just passed in the United States Congress that he opposed. He said there's too much spending. He didn't name a single spending program that he would cut apart from a golf course. By the way, that golf course that was funded is in Union County, which you have represented for the last 20 years, Galloping Hill. You did nothing about the fact that we have a publicly funded golf course uh, in New Jersey and as if that would actually end inflation in, in the United States. This is silly. So, this is not serious. Mr. Malinowski. On the I labor market, thank you. Um, the, 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 the answer, it's not our benefit programs. We, we ended the, the COVID relief benefit programs. The problem is that we right now in the United States of America have more jobs than before the pandemic, in part because of the infrastructure bill 
all the productive investments that we have made. We have more jobs, but we have fewer people. We lost over a million Americans. We had people resigning from the workforce, people retiring early. We also had a four-year shutdown in legal immigration to the United States of America. So what is the solution to this problem? Number one, we do need a different culture of training and work in this country. We need more emphasis on the trades. We need more emphasis on community colleges. Not every kid needs to go to a four-year school, but we also need to restore the ethos that the Republican Party used to believe in under Ronald Reagan, and that is that this country needs legal immigration. The only thing you've said about immigration in your campaign, Senator Kane, on your alternative MAGA website is that you will build a wall. And every single person I speak to who owns a business in the state of New Jersey, large and small, is telling me the same thing. We need legal immigration to expand the size of our workforce. Otherwise, we okay. cannot I'm grow. Sorry, your time is up. That was a really nice segue because, Mr. Kane, mm -hmm. throughout the history of our country, mm -hmm. we have looked toward immigrants to solve labor shortages. Mm -hmm. Since Congress cannot seem to pass any type of comprehensive immigration reform legislation, would it be a good idea to totally revamp our guest worker program and make it fast and easy to use guest workers to alleviate these shortages? Certainly. Um, I served in the state legislature for 20 years. And every day, the Congress didn't do its job on fixing uh, the border security or the immigration system is, is a t time that w people on the local level had to make the decisions and react to that. Clearly, we need to have a broader reform, it's all, but it's all part of a comprehensive solution. Yes, we need to secure the southern border. Yes, we need to continue the DACA program, keep those types of promises. Yes, we need to you know, work on the, the guest worker programs, the agriculture programs, the tech and IT um, you know, programs in the short term to ensure we meet that need. But the, that doesn't say, it's because Congress hasn't been doing its job for the last 20 years that this problem exists. So we, I will get down to Washington, D.C. and find that common ground. It's because we can both have programs like DACA and reform the immigration system in a responsible way that treats families fairly from across the globe while in turn making sure we continue to have security here at home. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski, same question. How can we get a vibrant guest worker program going to help us through these labor shortages? Uh, elect people to Congress who actually believe in legal immigration. And <laughs> look, there's a reason why Congress has been stuck on this. All right. Ten years ago, we had a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform that was passed by John McCain and Lindsey Graham and Democrats in the United States Senate that would have secured our border and I voted for tens of billions of dollars for border security in the last few years, but also would have given a pathway to citizenship, to legal work for millions of people, hardworking immigrants in this country that would have enforced E-Verify for our employers. This was a good bipartisan middle of the road solution. And the ascendant wing of the Republican Party blocked it in the House. We passed in the House last year reform to our farm worker immigration program. We actually got about 20, 30 Republicans who are courageous enough to cross the aisle and vote for it. It's blocked by Republicans in the United States Senate. You think of this guy who ran, who announced his campaign with Kevin McCarthy, who demonizes immigrants every single day, this guy who in his Republican primary, the only thing he said was we gotta build a wall. You think he's gonna go there and somehow convince the Republican party that it's going to, to, to break with the MAGA wing, to break with Trump, to break with the build the wall crowd that is ascended in their party and pass immigration reform? Are you kidding? Look at what Don, Ron DeSantis is doing. Look at what the emerging leaders in his party are doing on immigration right now, using human beings as pawns to try to get votes, to get people angry at immigrants, to blame immigrants for the problems in our country. It's a joke. I will support comprehensive immigration reform that's, that, that includes security, that includes actual enforcement of these rules on employers, but that also is consistent with the generosity of this country and the economic self-interest of this country. That's what we need. Thank you. So if we could hold the clapping, please. 
Now we're going to move into a discussion of health care. And we've had this discussion. It's going to be about the Affordable Care Act, of course. We've had this every year since 2010 when the Affordable Care Act was first passed. Mr. Malinowski, it has the Affordable Care Act has become an accepted part of the American health care system. More than 30 million people were added to the roles of the insured because of the ACA. However, there are still 30 million uninsured in this country. Why is that? Uh, we took a gigantic step forward with the Affordable Care Act. And let's not forget, um, a few years ago, it was came within one vote in the United States Senate of being repealed. And we all know whose vote that was. It was John McCain. And then we lost John McCain. And had Democrats also lost the House that year, the Affordable Care Act would have been repealed and tens of millions of Americans would have had no health care during the COVID pandemic. Now we feel like it's settled law. I hope it's settled law, but you know what else we thought was settled law in America? Roe versus Wade for 50 years. And do not, do not doubt this, that if, again, the ascendant MAGA wing of the Republican Party takes control of the House and the Senate, that the Affordable Care Act will be in the crosshairs Again, I hope that doesn't happen, but it's on us to prevent that from happening. Now, what we have done, because the number one complaint about the ACA when I first ran was that it wasn't affordable, and that was a, that was a fair critique. We passed legislation, uh, which we just renewed this summer, that caps the, the, the price that middle-class Americans pay for health insurance in this country at 8.5% of their income. That was a huge, huge advance in making uh, not healthcare not just accessible, but affordable for millions of middle-class Americans who didn't have that before. Um, I think we need to take additional steps forward. Um, I, I think we should allow every single American to be able to buy in to a public option, into a system like Medicare, so that there is um, not just more access to healthcare, but more competition in the healthcare marketplace to keep those insurance rates down. Um, so that's what I would do. Uh, I would build on that progress, and I will make sure, if I'm elected, that we are not going to go back to the world that existed before the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Mr. Kane, same question. There are still 30 million people uninsured. Why is that? Well, um, too many people in this district are making the difficult decision between whether they can pay for the prescription drug and afford that, pay for food, or pay to heat their home. That's unacceptable. And my opponent, just this summer, even the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, said that, that I, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act would actually increase the cost of prescription drugs, which would make people's lives less certain. We need to you know, make sure there's more transparency through the um, drug pricing system so we have predictability at the counter. And so there are no surprises through the supply chain. We need to ensure that we protect pre-existing conditions. We need to make sure there are more jobs and more cures found here at home so we can have those types of drug um, you know, affordability and solutions to, so we can actually cure cancer and diabetes and, those, and you know, find uh, real solutions. My opponent um, votes for a piece of legislation that makes that more difficult. I, on the other hand, on the state level, made sure that we, you know, in, in, ensured that physical and mental health were, were treated the exact same by, uh, for, by the insurance companies. I uh, made sure that when the, you had the uh, cancer people, uh, people were, were being treated with cancer, uh, that they had the co-pays capped. Uh, we uh, ensured that um, we had more opportunities for people to have predictability in the supply chain. But we can do that down in Washington, D.C. if we can find that common ground where we protect pre-existing conditions, lower the cost of prescription drugs, have more innovation and opportunity so we can actually find that solution. And that will help ensure that more people are seeking insurance as we have affordability uh, options as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski. How, providing subsidies for the Affordable Care Act makes it more affordable for individuals but that is simply shifting the cost from individuals to taxpayers. 
how in general can we make healthcare more affordable? The Inflation Reduction Act takes a stab at this, um, but it only does 10 drugs only for Medicare and not until 2026. So it's not something that's going to really have much effect, but how can we just make healthcare more affordable or at least stop these tremendous increases that we're seeing year over year? Yeah, it, that's an excellent question. And, uh, and, and I agree with the, the premise of it. We've made it more affordable, but we haven't, um, we have not yet done enough to attack the underlying problem, which is the fact that Americans pay about 12% of our national income on healthcare, most other wealthy countries, uh, only about six or 7%, um, even though their healthcare outcomes are pretty much as good uh, as ours. Um, again, we made prescription drugs more affordable. We made health insurance more affordable. And I do not want to downplay the importance of those achievements because again, middle-class Americans are gonna benefit from that right now. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act um, does take on part of this underlying problem, which is the fact that in America we pay, seniors in particular pay twice, three times, five times, six times as much for medicines as in most other countries. Senator Kane uh, just said something very strange, that the CBO somehow said that this would make uh, drugs less affordable, that it would cost more money. I'm sorry, the CBO said that it would save Medicare hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years, even though you're right, we are only negotiating 10 drugs in 2026, then 20, then 30, then 40, then 50, then more in succeeding years. This is gonna save seniors money. And let me be clear, I am in favor of allowing Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices for our seniors. That is common sense. Everyone I speak to, Republicans and Democrats in the district, believes that. President Trump promised to get that done. We just got it done, and Senator Cain was against it. That's a very, very clear distinction between us and this campaign. In terms of dealing with um, the underlying costs, I already mentioned something else that I would support, which is to create more competition in the health insurance marketplace by allowing Americans to choose whether they want a private health insurance plan or whether they want to buy in to an option on the public marketplace like Medicare. Um, I've supported that for everybody. I've been trying to pass a much more modest bill to support that, at least for our firefighters, our police officers, our first responders. That is something, because I believe in capitalism and market competition, um, and our insurance companies have been protected from that. That is, I think, and a very important thing that we could do practically that would begin to get at the underlying problem you mentioned, Jim. Thank you. Mr. Mellon, or Mr. Kane, same, same question. What can we do to bring down healthcare costs or, or get more control over them, at least, for the entire population? Well, as, as you discussed, um, too often, uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act is one of them, um, you remove money that should be in, in Medicare and you use it for another purpose, which in the end makes everything more expensive. Uh, I think the best way for um, to reduce insurance, number one, we, uh, the cost of insurance, uh, we need to be able to take on the large insurance companies. Right now, they have too much power in every single negotiation. And I think that's a start. We have to have more competition um, for competing, new, for finding uh, more drugs and more opportunities. My opponent supports price controls. People in this district don't support price controls. They want affordable health care. And the bills that my opponent continues to support are going to make health care uh, now and over time more affordable. On state level, I was able to find the common ground that actually addressed the affordability and accessibility. Um, but you can do that while protecting pre-existing conditions and, and having a long-term plan that makes healthcare far more affordable and also more accessible, as we were talking about earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so before we move into our next topic of discussion, which is public health, I want to, to note that I've been asking about the ACA since 2012, and I hope that one day one of the candidates or some member of con uh, Congress is going to take note that 5% of the population account for 70% of healthcare expenditures. 
we have some really sick people out there and we need to start discussing how to efficiently and effectively deliver care to them because that's really where the cost driver is. Now, this conversation is very relevant for, for where we're moving next into public health. Um, and we're gonna talk about the farm bill. So for years, I've been trying to figure out how to get the farm bill into this discussion. And finally, last week, Senator Booker showed me the way. So we're gonna talk about the farm bill, um, probably something that is never discussed in New Jersey political circles. The, uh, the farm bill was first passed in 1933 and it is renewed every five years. So it's coming up for renewal in 2023. It's gonna be a big part of the, the next Congress. Um, it was designed to make sure that the United States never suffered a shortage of food. And it did this by ensuring that there is so much production that even in a disastrous year like this year, there's enough of a harvest that there's plenty of food for everyone. I think that it's one of the most important pieces of regulation or legislation that Congress deals with on an ongoing basis. Now, by 1939, and forgive me for giving all this history, but since nobody knows what the Farm Bill is, I think it's kind of important. Um, by 1939, it became clear that the Farm Bill worked so well that we just had huge surpluses that were, were in storage. And so two programs were developed to um, manage those huge surpluses. One was the PL480 program, which is an export um, program to export U.S. Um, grain primarily overseas. And the second one was the food stamp program. Um, again, both were designed to cut down on the, the storage caused by excess production. So as a public health matter, Mr. Kane, today the food stamp program, which is called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, Mm -hmm. accounts for about 75% of the USDA's budget. It is no longer targeted to eliminate food surpluses, but rather to provide nutritional support to low-income houses. Should the SNAP program be part of the USDA budget, or would it be better placed in HHS where it could be coordinated with other forms of health assistance? Yeah. Jim, you must not get out very much. <laughs> The farm bill is discussed with great frequency throughout this district and those issues. I'm just joking, Jim. Sorry. The um, um, when you talk go around this district, um, whether it's the SNAP benefits or the agriculture and making sure that we're actually looking at from a supply chain issue, that we're actually growing things uh, here at home, especially when you look at um, the, with the war in Ukraine and the and the impact on uh, potential uh, global um, you know, droughts and uh, fo food supplies. Um, it is an issue that's discussed. And I think that continuing to ensure we meet the needs, um, you know, to, you know, I think the answer is whatever it is that gets, make sure it, it, that the food stamp program uh, and the other programs are, are best, most efficiently delivered. Um, and I'm happy to work with, with Senator Booker or anybody else down there to say what that best efficiency is. You know, on the state level, I, we were uh, able to transform uh, you know, several programs on health and human services in an efficient way by moving those, those you know, responsibilities to other areas. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's whatever it is that, that allows for that food security and, um, and uh, reliability and affordability to get achieved. Thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Same question. Sure. Uh, well, if we're if we're talking about SNAP, let, let's bring this back to the real world of Washington D.C. and what's happening in Congress. Again, we have an ascendant wing of the Republican Party in Washington D.C. that has tried time and time again. They don't have the majority right now, but they've tried time and time again to either um, significantly cut or eliminate the the SNAP program or to impose work requirements. Um, which would actually be an anti-work provision because families who are struggling, making minimum wage or very low wages, they're working, but they need things like the SNAP program to be able 
to take care of their kids. And no child in this country, no child should go hungry. No child should be deprived of the most important thing that everybody needs for survival, and that's having three healthy meals every single day. So, you know, those are nice words, but, but let's remember what's at stake in this election. It's who controls Congress for the next two years. And if we have a change, there's going to be attack after attack after attack on these basic nutrition programs. In terms of the farm bill in, in, in our district, look, one, one of my concerns, and this is purely a public health issue, we, we've talked about the problems with our health insurance system and, and the importance of getting drug prices down. But we also have a, an agricultural um, system supported by big industry and for many, many years by the federal government that emphasizes the production of things that aren't actually very healthy for us. We subsidize corn syrup more than we subsidize carrots. Um, we have a category in the USDA, I want to change this, that they refer to as specialty crops. Do you know what specialty crops are? Vegetables and fruits and whole grains and things that are actually that we actually eat. And when I talk to our farmers in this district, that's actually what we grow in this part of New Jersey. We don't have huge commodity agriculture. We have a lot of smaller farms that grow things that people want to eat. What I want to do with the farm program is to provide more government support for the type of farming that, that, that farmers in New Jersey actually do and that produce food that's healthy for us to eat. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Kane. When we discussed health care spending, I mentioned that a small number of people account for most of the health care expenditures. The bulk of the spending for maladies is related to diet and um, lifestyle. And they include heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and obesity. The largest single expenditure by the SNAP, by SNAP program recipients is for soft drinks. It is followed closely by spending for prepared desserts, bagged snacks like potato chips, and other pretty unhealthy foods. These purchases are not that different from the general population, but should the government be spending money on unhealthy food and then spending more money on the healthcare costs that result from those bad choices? We do not allow food stamps to be used for alcohol and tobacco. Um, I, th I think that um, I um, did the SNAP program for a week, I and, and many other legislators here in um, in New Jersey. And when you go and you search the grocery store shelves, if you're trying to live on that on, on that budget, uh, you see that the food, the only food that somebody can afford, is the Wonder Bread, the peanut, you know, peanut butter, a number of other uh, products. And um, so we need to ensure that we need to get rid of the food deserts that exist in places like you know have existed over time in, in newark and other places we need to inject more uh, health um, more support for funding into those uh, areas i would not limit what in that regard what the, the money would be spent for but i think there are uh, there are you can do both at the same time meaning meaning very specifically that you can ensure that we uh, have the, uh, you know, if you're looking at the end result expenses, um, you know, we, we can figure out with a partnership between insurance companies, uh, hospitals, uh, families, the schools, they, you, to have those types of health uh, programs. At the exact same time, we, we can um, ensure that they have healthy uh, products in, in food. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski, same question. Should we be restricting what people can buy with food stamps to more healthy foods? Within reasonable limits, yes, and so long as those healthy foods are affordable with the food stamp program. Um, and again, remember why you know, we have these rules, because of the influence of very big corporate lobbies on members of Congress. This is one reason why I have had a policy since I first ran for Congress of not taking campaign contributions from corporations from corporate political action committees. That is a big difference between myself and Senator Kane. Um, and, um, you know, Jim, let me, let me just say, you, you've exercised uh, editorial judgment by introducing this issue, which I agree is very, very important. But if we're gonna be talking about public health in America right now, how can we not talk about the fact that women across this country, in half of the states in this country, are being denied by legislation supported by my opponent's party 
one of the most basic public health services that we have taken for granted for over 50 years. There are women in this country who, um, who have miscarriages and doctors are afraid to treat those miscarriages because they might, they might be treated as criminals. We, we have women who are being denied um, drugs at pharmacies that they need for life-threatening conditions, for pain, for arthritis, for things that they desperately need to preserve their health, and pharmacies are denying them these drugs because they are afraid under these new draconian abortion bans that they will be treated as criminals. And one of the big differences between myself and Senator Kane is that I support legislation at the federal level that would restore the rights that the Supreme Court took away from American women, right to have health care, basic health care services for all of the states in this country. And he believes every state should just decide for itself. All right. I want to move into it to our last topic of discussion today, and that is essential industry. Mr. Malinowski, a long time ago, agriculture was determined to be an essential industry in this country. We provide incentives and subsidies to farmers to ensure adequate food supplies. Recently, the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors Act, or CHIPS, how long does it take them to come up with these names, by the way? Surely they started with chips and then figured out, okay, what can we make? What words can we put with that? Um, it's one of our most important responsibilities. Boy, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. But anyway, the, the CHIPS Act was passed, um, recognizing that semiconductors are essential to our economy and national security. Was this a necessary piece of legislation? And is it worth the 280 billion dollar price tag? Uh, yes, and absolutely. And as you look at that price tag, remember that actually most of that money is going to be provided in the form of loans and loan guarantees. It will be paid back to the American taxpayer with interest. So the, the, the price tag is, is very deceptive. Look, we, we, were, we are in a race against time um, to bring back manufacturing of critical technologies like microchips to the United States. We used to make this stuff in America. We used to make more than 30, 35% of the world's semiconductors in the United States. In terms of advanced semiconductors right now, that's uh, about zero. Um, we have a massive shortage of semiconductors across the world. Um, the reason why we had inflation in the automotive marketplace last year was 100% because of the global chips shortage. Again, we used to make them in America. 70% of the world's semiconductors are now made in Taiwan. And if China does to Taiwan what Russia is doing to Ukraine, the impact on our economy and the global economy will be like nothing we are experiencing today. This was absolutely the right thing. It was bipartisan in the Senate. And once again, Republicans mostly in the House chickened out, even though most of them in their hearts wanted to support this bill. They didn't want President Biden to have a win. We passed it. It's a great thing for the American economy. And in the last few weeks, we've had announcement after announcement after announcement of job creating investments in the United States producing microchips. I passed a second bill in the House of Representatives. I wrote the supply chain provisions of this bill with Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger that would do for other critical industries what we're doing for microchips. Because we cannot be dependent on countries like China anymore for industries that are critical to our economic and national security. What this legislation, the American Competes Act, would do is to create an office at the Secretary at the Department of Commerce that will monitor our supply chains 24-7, anticipating supply chain disruptions before they happen, and invest, again, billions of dollars, mostly loans and loan guarantees, to help manufacturers bring those jobs, bring those supply chains back home to America in areas like battery technology, for example, solar panels. Um, PPE, we cannot have a shortage of that in America anymore. Pharmaceutical ingredients. Did you know that right now, more than 90% of the ingredients that make antibiotics that we need in the United States come from China? I don't think that's an acceptable vulnerability. Again, if there's a war over Taiwan or anything else, I do not want China controlling our antibiotic supply, which they currently do. I passed that legislation. Senator Kane keeps talking about we got to do something about the supply chains. I passed that legislation. There's a version in the Senate that we are negotiating right now. We are getting this done. Thank you.
Mr. Kane, same same question. Was the CHIPS Act a necessary piece of legislation? Absolutely. It should have been done earlier. Um, my opponent, for 30 years in Washington, D.C., has supported exporting manufacturing jobs to China. Up only this year has he started to change tune. He has put us in this position where the outsourcing of jobs to China, outsourcing of jobs to many other countries, and, and hurting the manufacturing. Now he continues to you know create those environments here at home where manufacturing is more difficult, the regulatory burden is harder. We're not energy independent in the ways that we need to be, and we need to ensure going forward. And I will, as your next member of Congress, focus on making sure we have support those types of industries, whether it's the, the, the pharmaceuticals, but as you said, it's also agriculture. And we'll look at the new technology that's going to um, you know, help land be more efficient and buildings be more efficient over time from agriculture uh, production. Um, we can do that. But Tom Wolnowski for 30 years has supported policies to outsource jobs away from America and now what we need to focus on is manufacturing and uh, and creating new jobs and, and more security here at home by lowering the overall tax burden making sure that we have responsible uh, regulation can stop the irresponsible spending out of washington dc and make sure we've got opportunities for our own common future in ways that tom will can't even understand thank you okay please please we're, we're almost at the end Mr. Malinowski, um, you mentioned a, a couple of other industries that you thought we should focus on. Um, economists usually frown on that, um, looking more for comparative advantage and moving more towards a global economy. But outside of, of pharmaceuticals and semiconductors, what other industries do you think we should focus on. And then actually say a couple words because I hear from politicians all the time, good manufacturing jobs, but I can't find workers to go to work in those good manufacturing jobs. It's an ongoing problem. So please. Thank you, Jim. Well, first I gotta, I, I've got to address that word salad. I don't know if anyone really understood what he said, but um, I'm sorry, I've been in Congress for four years, not 30 years, sir. You've, you've been, been in Washington, right? D.C. for 30 years. And oh, in the entire time you've been in D.C., you moved down and you never left. You stayed okay, down. That You've please, been in Congress for four uh, years. Can, you moved you know, down and you never left. No, no, no. This is our last Come question. Okay. Come on. This is, this, this, this is silly. Um, you've been in Trenton for 20 years. What the hell have you done about cost of living in the state of New Jersey? What the hell have you done about property taxes that have gone up and up and up and up? You are the Senate minority leader. You are the most powerful Republican in New Jersey. For, for most of the last 20 years. Mr. Malinowski, the, the question is I'm about sorry. essential industries. I understand. I okay, but I gotta, I gotta address that. And, and you've said absolutely nothing about what you would do. You mumble about supply chains. I actually got the job done. I've been in Washington for four years. We passed an infrastructure bill, which your party failed to do. We passed the CHIPS Act, which your party failed to do. We passed Medicare negotiation, which Donald Trump promised to do and didn't do. We got it done. And you're up, you've offered in the last hour absolutely nothing specific that you would do other than what we have done. Now, in terms of essential industry, I think I answered that, that question, Jim. I passed legislation in the House of Representatives that would create a program, a brand new program at the Department of Commerce to distinguish between things that aren't essential, like, you know, water bottles, and things that are essential to our economic and national security. It shouldn't be politicians that make those decisions, but I did name some examples of things that I think are pretty plainly essential, like pharmaceutical ingredients, like the technology, the high technology that we do not want China to dominate in the future. Recently, I was pressing Joe Biden to take action against China's semiconductor industry, and last week he did. He issued an executive order that will crush China's semiconductor industry. That's something I asked him to do, and he did. We need those jobs, that manufacturing, for that kind of technology here in the United States. And then you made another point that I also already addressed, which is we're creating all of these jobs. That is a great thing through the infrastructure bill, through the CHIPS Act, through these other investments that I hope to make. We are creating them in the United States. We need to train our workforce 
better for the jobs that are actually being created, which is why I emphasize trades and community colleges, and we need a larger workforce. And there's only one way to do that, and that is to break through the far-right anti-immigration policies that have shut down most legal immigration to this country over the last four years. We've got to have more guest workers. We have to have refugee admissions. We have to have comprehensive immigration reform that allows people who desperately want to work to be taxpayers, to contribute to the American dream, to be able to do that. And if we aren't willing to do those things, if we don't have people who stand up to the toxic anti-immigration politics in the Republican Party right now, we are not going to solve the problem that you just raised. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. So, Mr. Cain, same, same question. What other industries other than um, semiconductors should we focus in on? My opponent, apparently afraid to admit he's lived in Washington, D.C. for the last 30 years. I don't know no, I'm not. why that would be. I'm shocked. The um, well, I was Jersey, serving my country, sir. What uh, were you doing? I'm just saying you didn't admit that you actually lived there for 26 years before you ran for Congress. That's the only thing I said. The, I the um, when we're um, listen, uh, manufacturing is the core of who we are as New Jerseyans. When we look in Patterson Falls, there was something called infant industries, and you made sure there were certain economic policies to ensure that we had the type of unique manufacturing, and you create policies to ensure hundreds of years ago to make sure that you could grow those businesses for a period of time. My opponent's policies have made us less secure on all the fronts that people in this room care about, energy security, technology security, privacy security. These are all things that we need to make sure, food security, we need to send a leader down to Washington, D.C., who has worked across the aisle to find those solutions to create new technologies, and whether it's brew pubs, Bell Labs, a dozen different industries in between that are here in Union County and throughout the state. That type of leadership and needs to be on whatever industry which we feel is a strategic disadvantage right now, and whether that's agriculture, various areas of technology, uh, other areas of, of chips, whatever it is, that allows us to compete. Because I think when we saw the um, pandemic hit, we all saw the impact of what happened when ships were coming over from China and what they could do if they, if they stopped you know, pushing over um, the, the pharmaceutical and the band-aids. So we need to make sure we've got more manufacturing here at home. We need to make sure this is a regional effort going forward so we have a strong manufacturing base, lower tax burden, energy independence, because we can, do, Therefore, you, know, you have liability. I mean, think about this. Nobody wants to be told they can only plug their cars in from 5 to 9 p.m. If somebody says an, an energy grid that doesn't work, how is somebody going to have the high-tech businesses okay. created I'm, here? I'm afraid we're out of time. These, we've Mr. got King. to focus on the solutions that actually solve the problems immediately so we can make mm -hmm. us all safer now and going forward. Okay, so now we're going to move into our concluding remarks. Um, for your closing remarks, I want to ask a question to get to your underlying philosophy. People have jobs because of business. Government has tax revenue because of business. Without a strong business sector, the economy will fail and the government will fail. However, businesses are often maligned in this country by the media and by the government. What can you do to make people realize the importance of a vibrant business sector and get them the support they need. Uh, Mr. Kane, we're going to start with you. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim, for hosting this event. Thank you for everybody for being here uh, today. Uh, and it's great to be with, with you yet again, Tom. Um, the, um, what we need to focus on as a country is equality of opportunity for people who are seeking the American dream. And we have to have the tax policies and the leadership at all levels of government, at all levels of industry, at all levels of not important nonprofits. You are an extraordinary advocate, Jim, for the business community, for the nonprofits who are in this region. You lead the strongest chamber in New Jersey because you do it with strength and you do it with foresight and you do it with passion. So when I go and talk to people about what they want and how we create the policies going 
forward. We can't malign the people who create the, the economies. Whether it, and you, you have to go and you have to listen to what their problems and their concerns are. The new regulation that has to get out of the way. The policy that when somebody says, you know, I'm moving Honeywell from New Jersey down to Tennessee. I'm moving the pharmaceutical sector from here up to Boston. I'm moving the energy production somewhere. Or worse, those individuals that make the decision not to move into the state in, in for that reason. We've got to have that philosophy as Americans to, to find those solutions that create the opportunities that reward success. I mean, that's who we are as Americans, right? We as Americans want people to succeed, want people to take risks. Those individuals who lead and partic participate in businesses are those types of leaders. And we need to make sure we create an environment that actually allows them to succeed. But when you listen to what my opponent has done for his 30 years in Washington, D.C., and his four years in Congress, he has voted for the right, he supported the regulations that make it more difficult to create opportunities. He doesn't understand the fact that we need to be energy independent. He's made sure that other countries can take advantage of us with great frequency. That's not what we need in a leader down in Washington, D.C. I am asking for your vote because I will be that leader who will listen, who will lead, and will fight to make sure that we break the back of inflation. Thank you. So, Mr. Malinowski, again, how can you work to make people realize the importance of the business community? Um, well, I think the question was on my economic philosophy. And, and let me, so let me answer that question. Um, very simply, and I've said a lot about it already today, I'm a believer in capitalism. I'm a believer in the free market economy, so long as we make sure that it works for everybody in our country, not just those at the very top. But there is another aspect of my economic philosophy, Jim, that we have not spoken about much today. And that is that if we want capitalism to work in America, democracy has to work in America. Business, the business community needs us to respect and defend the Constitution and the rule of law. The business community needs us to speak and defend the truth in our country. The business community needs us to resolve our differences in America by voting and not by violence. And we all know that those values are under attack in America today like never before. I was there on January 6th. I know what happened. And I know that the extremism has gotten worse. The divisions have gotten worse since then. Now, my opponent had a choice. He could have chosen to run in this campaign as a conservative Republican criticizing me on issues like taxes and spending, the things that Democrats and Republicans usually argue about, while standing up to the rising extremism in his party, to the election lies, to the threats of violence, like so many Republicans with integrity and courage have done over the last couple of years. Instead, he chose to make his peace with the MAGA wing, whether out of conviction or opportunism, I don't know, but he ran as a MAGA Republican this year. He went out there, talked to every single Republican voter in his primary and said he would stand with Donald Trump. He said that he would support the Trump agenda, that he would have Trump's back no matter what Trump does. I'm not accusing him of that. I'm simply quoting the words on his own campaign literature. Now, if he is elected as our congressman, I don't think we're going to be hearing much about Tom Kane Jr. in Washington, D.C. He'll fade into the woodwork just like he did in Trenton for 20 years. But we are going to be hearing a lot about Kevin McCarthy, about Jim Jordan, about Marjorie Taylor Greene, about, God forbid, Herschel Walker, about these extreme MAGA candidates who are winning election after election and replacing Republicans of principle and courage like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger who are being thrown out of their party right now. This is not a Congress that will be passing economic legislation this is not a Congress that will be attacking inflation. This is a Congress that will be impeaching and investigating and doing things that are outright crazy for the next two years. 
I've been different. I'm a Democrat, but I'm not, I do not hesitate to criticize Joe Biden as I did over uh, Afghanistan, the withdrawal from that country, as I did over uh, the student loan decision that he made. I have put together a campaign with Republicans, independents, and Democrats. I'm the only candidate on the stage who has cross-party support. And in that basis, in that spirit, I am asking for your support for another two years in Congress to keep serious governance going and to keep the crazy out of our government. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so that concludes our debate this morning. I want to thank everybody for coming and, and for being a pretty courteous audience. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Malinowski and Mr. Kane for taking the time to be with us today. I hope everyone found the discussion as informative and worthwhile as I did. November 8th is election day. Vote. Thank you.